All right. Thank you, Pete, for having me here. Um, this is, uh, in, in a lot of parts of the state, this is a pretty timely topic. Uh, I know here in the Panhandle and down into West Texas, for sure, uh, we had pretty good fall last year, and we're having a pretty miserably dry year this year. And so we are kind of primed for some, some wildfire activity. And so that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. What I want to talk, I mean, there are several things that I want to cover. One is just basic fire, prepare, fire behavior and preparation, particularly of your homestead. And then if fire is coming, then how do you respond? Uh, how do you how do you manage things safely? How do you uh, protect your belongings? How do, how do you protect yourselves? Uh, we've had in the last oh five or six years here in in the Panhandle, we've had some really big wildfires and we've had some fatalities. We've lost homes, uh, those kind of things, and so I want to talk a little bit about about that part. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what happens, what what increases fire danger, uh, what happens during and after a fire as far as the vegetation, and and what to do about that, particularly with regard to managing the the plant community and trying to make sure that it recovers as rapidly as possible then talk about a little bit you know what the conditions are during and before the fire and how that affects the severity of the of the results and a little bit about how to manage after the fire to to make sure that things get a little bit better Historically, oh, probably at least east of, uh, say, Highway 281 in Texas, most of this country, on average, burned about every six to ten years. In some, I've seen uh, some accounts that say as much as three years. Uh, Ferdinand Raymer, who did a whole lot of the, I mean, he named a lot of the plants. That, that grow in Texas. He, in his diaries, he tells about going through the hill country and in several places talking about, well, the country is black because the Indians had burned the country in front of him. Fire was a very uh, widely used tool for a whole lot of different purposes to manage brush, to manage fire danger, to change up plants to draw game to keep your enemies away all kind of things that it was used for and so we live in an area that was shaped by fire fire is going to happen we need to be prepared for it when it does generally the big really intense wide spreading fast moving fires generally occur when you have a wet year followed by a really dry year and particularly a really dry year and then you get into the windy part of the year is when those really get bad if you keep suppressing fire you're going to get bigger fires when they occur uh, these big fires in california which i mean they're not necessarily concerning us so much but my brother sent me a text the other day asking, said, well, you know, what can they do about that? And I said, that country historically burned about every two to three years. And a lot of those fuels are very volatile, even, I mean, even under the best of circumstances. I said, the main thing they need to do is don't build in the middle of a bunch of it. In our case, most of our volatile fuels come in after we don't burn 
for quite a while. Things like cedars, they start to come in when fire is suppressed. We need to control those volatile fuels. We need to control the amount of fuels even that are not particularly volatile. If we don't manage fuel loads and fuel continuity, we're asking for trouble when a wildfire occurs. For any fire to happen, we've got to have a fuel source or resources to burn. We have to have atmospheric conditions that are conducive for the fire and then we have to have something that ignites the fire. In relatively natural settings, generally that is your, the, the degree of activity that you have is generally based on what kind of a year are you having and, and what kind of year preceded it. When we get into a humanized fire triangle, we have more man-induced issues that affect all three of those things, particularly the resources to burn and the source of ignition. A lot of times we are planting things that tend to burn well. We may, may or may not manage the fuel loads particularly well. And we certainly have more opportunities for ignition. Uh, I mean, my dad worked for the railroad. They had an engine one time that was blowing sparks out the, out the exhaust. And they started a pretty long stretch of country on fire adjacent to the railroad. We've all gone down the highway and seen places where, for whatever reason, now, some people will say it may be a cigarette. Others say a cigarette won't start a fire. But for whatever reason, you'll see the road ditches are burned. Uh, we have power lines. We have all kind of things that can increase the likelihood of ignition. And that gets us more active wildfire seasons. So I talked about a few of these the power lines and the way that they are that they're put in. If they're made where they tend to whip in the wind and they may arc across, that may be a problem where just the just a well installed line is not. That's what started some of our wildfires up here several years ago. Agricultural practices uh, either, I mean you can graze things down really tight and you don't get wildfires until you get a really bad wildfire that's running through some of these volatile woody fuels. Uh, but if you don't graze enough or you have very, you have moderate loads but they go for long distances, you can end up with more fires. Uh, we talked about roads and railroad lines. Introduced vegetation, old world blue stems tend to be more volatile fuels than most of our native grasses and they tend to burn more readily and hotter. Uh, if we have suppressed fire for a long period of time, one of the things that we run into here, when we had some of these big fires, we had a lot of old CRP that had several years of old dead fuel built up in them. The most intense fires occurred when they hit those old CRP fields. Uh, construction materials. What, uh, this is a little more towards what happens when you have a fire coming and how likely is your home or your buildings to burn. In my view, you know, cedar shake shingles are a no-no under any circumstances whatsoever. Uh, Asphalt shingles are a little better. Steel roofs are better still. Uh, wooden siding, vinyl siding, those kind of things can be a very big issue if you have fire come up into the into your headquarters area. 
uh, landscaping. We're gonna I'm gonna show a few examples here in a little bit. Everybody likes to have a nice lawn. Well, lots of people do. Having that nice lawn is a wonderful thing until you maybe you're in the dormant season and fire season is approaching, and now you've got a big dense thatch of dead material that burns very readily. Uh, timing of activities and disturbances. Uh, people people uh, having a barbecue during the middle of a drought with fuel loads around them that may catch fire. Um, those kind of issues. And then the maintenance and management of the practices that we do. We may have and I'll be talking about some things that you can do, but if you don't maintain those practices and you start building up fuel loads or they come up closer, that can be a big issue. Fire, fire travels before, because fire can. The type of the fuel, the amount of the fuel, and the continuity of the fuel and the topography of the country determine what's the potential rate of spread and intensity of the flames. Wind can carry it uh, some other places too or exacerbate those problems. Ambient temperature and relative humidity will also affect how intense the fire is. You don't burn the actual fuels, you're burning the hot gases that come off of those fuels. So you have to get that wood or grass or whatever to a high enough temperature that it starts to drive those, those gases off and then that's what starts the fire. If you're starting with a higher temperature during the day, you've got that many fewer degrees that you have to raise the temperature. Relative humidity, cold air holds more, uh, it will, it, at the same amount of moisture in the air, cold air will have a higher relative humidity than warm air. That's why we get sweat on the south side of a tea glass. That's why we get dew on the grass. A general rule of thumb is every 20 degree increase we have in the temperature, we're going to the relative humidity will drop by half. So if we start with dew on the ground and it's 60 degrees, about the time we get to 80 degrees, we're going to be at 50% relative humidity. If it gets to 100 degrees, then we're at 25% humidity. If we start with a relative humidity lower than that, then it just it gets to very low relative humidities quickly. The less, the, the more, higher the relative humidity, the more moisture we have in the fuels. The lower relative humidity, the less moisture in the fuels. If we don't have to drive that moisture off, the temperature of that fuel will go up quicker. So the hotter and the drier it is, that's why fire goes so much faster that way. So the things we can do, we can manage those fuel loads and more, at least as important, manage the continuity of fuels. It can't go anywhere if it doesn't have anything to burn, especially around our houses and shops and barns and those kind of things. That's where we really need to worry about fuel continuity, volatility of the fuels, and the amount of fuel. Keeping bare areas, that's the best way to stop that. Now, you'll see people that will go in and either grade or disc a little fire break around outside of their place. And that's a great idea. I mean, if you have a ground driven fire, it's, it's you know, pretty tame. Not a lot of wind, you know, uh, relative humidity and temperatures are fairly moderate. Somebody 
starts a fire in the road ditch, it will get to that fire break and stop. But if you've got a wind-driven wildfire under very, you know, high temperatures, low humidity, those kinds of things, it's going to jump that fire break. Now, you may want to have a couple of those kind of fire breaks where if there's one coming in, you can burn out between those and widen that area with no, with no fuel to carry a fire, and that may help you out. Strategic grazing or a prescribed burn. So you start, you've had a really wet year. It's coming into a dry spring. You're going to have high winds. You may decide to go in there and either graze out between those fire breaks or burn out between those fire breaks just as a, as a precautionary thing. Manage those volatile fuels, particularly near your structures. Uh, and, and again, I'll show you some pictures here in a minute about that. And then we're in a very Republican state and we don't like to be told what to do. But fire codes were put in so that we didn't have, you know, entire towns get burned down if one house started on fire. Uh, zoning. So, you know, even, even, and I hate them, but you know, covenants on a on a housing development. Those kind of things can help take care of these. When we're talking about safeguarding a, a headquarters, we need to think about three zones. Zone one is within 30 feet of a structure. Zone two is from there out to 100 feet from the structure, and zone three is out to 200 feet from the structures. And we do different things in each of those zones. In zone one, you want zero plants with volatile fuels. That means pretty much anything that if you crush the leaves and it has a smell, it probably has some kind of a volatile oil in it. Junipers would be number one, but even things like uh, uh, some of the old world blue stems, uh, uh, broom weed or broom snake weed if you're in the right part of the country. Uh, some of the weeds that we have have these volatile oils. Those tend to burn extremely hot and so we don't want to have them close. Short lawns, all our trees need to be pruned from the ground up to about six feet, and we don't want any of them closer than 30 feet apart, and preferably out on the outer edge of that, of that zone one. A problem we can have is even with deciduous trees, even ones that are trimmed up to six feet, we end up with dead leaves hanging in the tree. Oaks are really bad about that, at least in this part of the country. And you start those leaves on fire. If you're very close to the house, then you've got the house started on fire too. Uh, Non-combustible roofing, we talked about that, and ember-tight vents. One, of, I mean, there's a couple of things as far as vents go that can be an issue. Bird nests, uh, mouse nests, even though they're fairly, you know, impermeable to embers, if one does get in there, now you've got something started in your attic or somewhere like that. Uh, the weep holes on a, on a brick house down close to the bottom where it lets out moisture from the inside the walls so you don't rot the walls out. If you've got fuels coming right to the base of the house, those flames can lick up in those weep holes, and now you've got a, a wall fire. Uh, if you have uh, gutters around the outside of the, you know, along the eaves, a lot of times you'll have those get filled up with old dead leaves and that kind of thing. Most of the time, what starts a, a house fire from a wildfire 
is not a raging wall of flames that come right up against the house. What happens is you have embers that are carried on the wind and they land in these gutters or something or land on your lawn and they start that on fire and that in turn gets the house started on fire. So you really need to be careful about those kind of things. Having you know, gravel paved concrete kind of uh, you know something right around the edge of the house in a lot of cases if you're living in in country like this like where I do where you have real high shrink swell soils that's a good idea anyways just so you don't have the the ground heaving and and messing up your your the foundation of the house but from a fire standpoint, that keeps that fire from carrying along the ground and getting right up against the house. And then the big one, you see it's crossed out there. Do not have any vegetation or combustible materials within 10 feet of the house. Uh, firewood stacked up against the house. It looks really rustic, but that's a great way <clears throat> to start a structural fire from a wildfire. This is a picture that I took not too far from my house. Now you look there, you've got juniper trees basically right up against the eaves of the house. You've got grass growing right up to the base of, and dry grass right up to the base of those juniper trees. Junipers, when, it, when you get into dry weather, in wildfire kind of weather, it doesn't take a whole lot of flame to get those junipers to start on fire and that and they will burn like they were soaked in gasoline and that's going to go right up there to that house that is a huge danger and in this part of the world the other thing that can happen where you have those trees growing right to the ground like that we get a lot of tumbleweeds that go blowing across the country and they will lodge in in those trees then you get a fire coming and really you know the trees are actually kind of moist and they're not so likely to start on fire but all those dead weeds that have blown up in there they tend to make a bigger fire that can dry out that foliage and now you've got the house started on fire too so this is I mean, this is really bad. It's coming from outside and moving in toward the house, and it's going to be in a. It's going to be intense enough that that's going to start a structural fire really quick that you can't get suppressed. Zone two is from that thirty feet out to a hundred feet out. In that area, you can start to have some trees but you still want to have them separated out enough where it's not just going to be a continuous wall of flame if any of them start on fire <coughs> if you want to have some close you know a little mod of trees that's fine but you want 30 feet in between those mods individual trees you want at least 20 feet apart and remember that's not 20 feet apart when they start you know when you're putting the seedlings in that's how bit how wide do you think that tree is going to grow and then you want 20 feet in between the outer limbs so that you're not going to start them on fire and then six feet up from the ground you want to have it pruned away so you're not getting a ground fire coming up into the canopy permanent fuel breaks uh, driveways that are weed free if they're graveled uh, concrete is better pavement is okay but something that that is an area where a ground driven fire will stop if it comes uh, you want to decrease the density and continuity of those fine fuels like grass and weeds 
by mowing, grazing, or or burning out, or even herbicides, those kind of things. The problem with mowing, just because you mow and just because you take that fuel, make that fuel shorter, doesn't mean you have decreased the continuity of those fuels, because if it gets dry, all of that litter that's laying on the ground is just another way for that fire to move in continuity. So, I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big believer. If you're out in the country, have some grazing animals that can kind of keep that stuff down. This is a little better than that last picture. Uh, at least the trees are trimmed up from the ground and they're not quite six feet, but they're pretty close. The problem with this is you can see the canopies of those trees are still nearly touching. And so if one of them does happen to start on fire, you've basically got a crown fire and it can carry around. But the good news is in this picture, they're all out away from the structures far enough where you may get some embers, but you're at least not going to have open, intense flames that are licking right up against the structure and starting it on fire. The other good thing here is they have that lawn down really close where if they have a ground fire come in there, flame lengths are going to be such that it's going to be really unlikely that those trees can start on fire very easy. Zone three is from that area out to 200 feet. There you want to kind of keep them, you know, don't let things grow up real tall. Uh, particularly be careful of those volatile fuels again. Uh, keep, try to keep La what is referred to as ladder fuels from from becoming an issue. So you have short trees in between the tall trees. The short trees can carry the fire up into the canopy of the of the tall trees. If you're in windy country like we are, a lot of people like and they're a good thing. I mean, it makes your life more pleasant in the winter to have a wind break around your your headquarters. But it's better to have, if you're going to have something like a juniper, have them on the far outside edge, trim them up pretty high, and then you have another row of something growing in inside of that that blocks that low, you know, the, the closer to the ground wind. And then you maybe have something a little further in than that that blocks it a little more. That way you're not having ladder fuels in between those, in between the ground and the canopy of those trees. Manage those windblown fuels, those tumbleweeds, those kind of things that come up into fence lines and that fence lines and tree lines. <clears throat> and then keep it mowed or keep it grazed. Uh, maybe put in your little disc or a, or a bladed windbreak to take care of those ground fires. This is just a little, uh, oh, kind of an artist rendition of, here would be a really good way of having a headquarters that was, you know, safeguarded against wildfire. <clears throat> so you have gravel or caliche or, or some way or another to keep all the plant material from growing right around those structures. That is going to prevent those ground driven fires. Your access road coming in is kept free of any vegetation. And then you can have a little, uh, a fenced in little trap or something where you keep the horses or you keep something there just during the dormant season, just before you know, you start really getting a fire issue, you can graze that down tight. That'll keep the grass healthy because you're not hurting it as much in the winter. And it can decrease the continuity of that fuel load so that 
Well, even if you do get it to start on fire, it's going to be a pretty tame fire, ground driven. It hits that gravel and you're, and you're still safe. <clears throat> Getting ready, again, decreasing the fuel loads, maintain those, maintain, everybody, even if you've got gravel, you're going to get a, you're going to get some weeds that start to grow through there. Put more gravel down, uh, mow it off, go in with a herbicide, do something to keep that down. Make sure there, there were a couple of places up in Kansas when we had those big wildfires here, they lost everything and they nearly lost some human life because <clears throat> they they didn't have more than what they thought they had a good escape route, but the route that they planned on leaving through had fire coming up on it and they hadn't planned real real well. And so they had to come up with another, another plan. So have a backup plan. Plan those routes and communicate them with your family, and make sure that they know and you, uh, everybody knows that everybody is getting out. There's been more than one instance where they get to a rallying point or whatever, or they didn't have a rallying point everybody's cell phone is going to be busy right about then. They started trying to call. They couldn't, you know, their daughter or whoever it was, they couldn't find them. They didn't know if they had gotten out. Somebody went back in to find them, got caught, and either nearly lost their life or lost their life because of it. So have a backup plan and communicate. Make sure everybody knows where to go, what to do, and that, y'all, this isn't a play, you know, this is, we get out now, nobody stays behind, and you go. The other thing that can be a really big deal, if you know that particularly like this big fire, you know there's fire in the country, you know you may have to leave at a moment's notice. Don't be sitting there saying so, you know, where's the insurance policy? Where's the deed to my property? Where's the titles to the vehicles? Where are all my family heirlooms and jewelry? Just get them gathered up, have them ready where if you've got to go, it takes you about two minutes. You get them thrown in the vehicle. You load up the dogs or the horses or whatever if you need to, and you get gone. When people come and when you have a firefighter come and say, you need to leave, you need to, you need to believe that, yeah, they know what, how serious this is. And when they're telling you to go, that means you really, really need to go. In a fire, everybody thinks about the danger of the flames, but it, the smoke has smoke and hot gases have probably killed more people than the actual flames have. All three of them go up, all three of them can kill you, and all three of them can kill you very quickly. Oddly, most wildland fires are that are fatal are grass fires. And I think there's two reasons for that. One is they tend to move a little faster and the other is, I think in a lot of cases, most people think, oh, it's just a grass fire. It doesn't last very long. It can't be that hot. So, you know, it's not that big a deal. Most of the people that are killed in wildfires are killed in grass fires. Keep in mind, you can be looking at a fire and it's moving along fairly, you know, you think, well, you know, a slow turtle could get in, uh, get away from that thing. If it hits a hill, you've got those flames bent over, preheating the fuel out in front of it, plus you've got 
the heat rises so it ten the hottest part of the fire is out on the tips of the flames not at the base and so you, it can be moving along pretty calmly and when it hits that that hill it just shoots to the top and you may get caught in it even worse is what is referred to as the the, the chimney effect so basically you've got two hills or, or you're a gully or something where you've got sides and then it's moving uphill too. And basically what ha you're holding that heat in and it's rising going up to the top and then it just shoots to the top and, and you can really, really get caught in bad trouble. Up dry, if you get a big fire, the heat rising basically creates a low pressure system. That's going to suck air in from outside. If you've ever been around when there's a there's a a little convection shower forming, and all of a sudden the wind comes up, that's what's happening here with with a fire. A lot of times the wind, I mean, it creates its own wind, and so just because the prevailing wind is say out of the south and you're on the south side of the fire you think oh that's not you know i'm safe because you're upwind but where it makes its own wind it may start blowing a mitt right at the fire front toward you so be very careful about that you can you there were there were some Firefighters got killed here uh, several years ago, one that I know of. The fire had burned up underneath a, a bridge, and they were going down a main highway, a paved highway, to get to another part of the fire. They drove out on that, that bridge, and it collapsed. And The fire didn't kill them directly. The collapse of the bridge did. Uh, you, know, you can have a flat, you can run off in a ditch, you can have a blowout, you can, you can run out of oxygen that makes the engine die if the, fi if the fire is hot enough, and then you're stranded. So be the only safe place you can be around the fire is way upwind or someplace that's already burned completely out. Uh, this guy in regard, uh, we've got a we've got a question here. It says our local horse community around Dripping Springs discuss these issues in regard to mutual aid with hauling horses, alternate routes, cutting fences to release or escape. All rural communities should be discussing neighborly assistance with saving livestock and cross property egress. And that that's absolutely correct. Now, be very careful about, you know, stopping to cut the fence or stopping to open the gate because you may get caught in the fire front. When you have fire, I mean, fire, is, you know it is coming towards you. Make your arrangements and then, I mean, don't dawdle. Get out. There, we had this one big fire that I keep coming back to. They had a helicopter pilot that was dropping fire retardant on it. And he clocked the rate of spread at 70 miles an hour. The fire can move faster than the wind is blowing because it's blowing embers out in front of the fire front and, and the fire is burning up to the next fire. Just because it's off on the horizon a ways, if it's moving towards you, that doesn't mean you've got plenty of time to come to get out. It can move very, very quickly to get to you. Maintain some communication, have, have a fire radio, have, I mean, li at least listen to the radio. A lot of places will have uh, on the cell phones where it will put out a mass bulletin and say, you need to do some, you know, you need to evacuate or the fire's moving in this fast and moving this direction. 
pay attention to those. Have the plan, have the backup plan, have things ready where you can get gone in a moment's notice. If you've got to stop and hook up the trailer before you gather up all the horses, that's taking valuable time. If the firefighters or the cops are telling you you need to go, that does mean you. And then make sure everybody understands that and knows and gets out. My brother-in-law's cousin, the firefighters were saying, you need to get out. The smoke's bad. It's going to be bad. He said, he told them where to head in. He decided he was going to go save the, the headquarters. And he did. Died of smoke inhalation two weeks later. It's not worth it. If, I mean, despite everything you've done trying to do right, wind shifts, whatever, fire's coming towards you. Stay calm. Don't panic. That gets more people than anything. Get to a safe zone. That means generally fuel-free or as fuel-free as possible. So a parking lot, uh, even, even a a road is better than nothing. Preferably something on the side the fire is coming from that if the fire burns up there close and it's a pretty big intense flame at least you're sheltered from some of the heat down low. If you can't find that stay in your vehicle or stay in some kind of a structure. The structure may start on fire, but generally this, if it's a front of flames, generally they don't last that long. Even if the structure starts on fire, you've let that big intense fire get past and then you can get out while the structure is burning. Vehicle is going to be a lot safer than not in the vehicle in that big intense fire that we had. There was a young man, his wife was still at home, he was at work. She was pregnant with, I think, their first child. He was scared, it was moving towards where they lived. He decided to go see if he could rescue her. I'd have done the same thing probably in his shape. He was driving toward the house. The flames were coming close whether it was smoke, whether it was a mechanic, for some reason or another, the vehicle quit him. The flames are coming toward him. He decided to get out and, and run for it. The flames overtook him and he lost his life because of it. If he'd have stayed in the vehicle, he would have probably made it out fine. If you stay in the vehicle, get down low, close all the vents, close all the windows. If you can, kind of block the windows off because the, the radiant heat from those flames can heat that up just like a hot day. Stay down low and generally the fire will run past you and you're going to be all right. Never ever drive into the smoke or toward the fire. You don't know what's on the other side. You may drive. You may drive off in a hole. You may drive off a cliff. I mean, you, so don't do that. Always remember what's most valuable, and stuff ain't the most valuable thing. Same fire, little different part. Some. Some people were trying, a friend of mine is owned the cattle, had the people hired. They loved him. He's a wonderful man. They wanted to save the cattle. They went out horseback, tried to gather the cattle and move them. They got turned around in all the smoke, got lost. A man, his wife, and another man, all three died in the flames. The cattle got away. When that fire's coming, you need to go. Clothing-wise, wool burns 
it, it's very hard to burn wool. Cotton is not quite as good, but it's better than pretty much anything else other than a fire suit. Polyester, any kind of a any kind of a synthetic will just melt and it can melt onto you and cause a lot of problems. So wear cotton if you can. Unfamiliar terrain or at night, A, you can get lost, B, you can end up in, I mean, you can end up somewhere that you don't know and you get broke down. Unfamiliar with what's going on weather-wise, is it getting hotter or drier, that sort of thing. Unfamiliar with the local conditions, not any kind of communication is going to be a problem being up high with the wind coming, I mean, with the fire coming at you. Uh, unburned fuel between you and the fire if you're very close. Hillsides, if the fires are, and this is more in forest kind of fires, but anything where something's up above you and could start on fire and then roll down can be a big issue. Uh, Weather changing, wind changing particularly, rough topography. You may be going somewhere and you think you're getting away from the fire and then you get blocked because, you know, it's a, it's a steep gully or whatever. All those things can be an issue. Any Anything that takes leaf off of plants is going to hurt them. A fire is no different than grazing, than mowing, than anything else. It removes that photosynthetic material and that plant's going to be hurt. We lose cover, that's going to dry out the ground. We lose some individual plants sometimes because we just cook the crowns of the grasses. We can have loss of nutrients because we volatilized them up in the smoke. We may get warmer soils, which may be a good thing, we get green up faster, or it may be a bad thing, we get drying out worse. We can get increased nutrient turnover because of that warmer soil, the microbes break down the organic material, and we get a release of nutrients. That's what a lot of people like about prescribed fire. We may change some competitive relationships. If we burned everything, the undesirable plants got hurt just as bad as the desirable plants, and now maybe the desirable plants have a little more of an advantage than they used to. So fire is not good or bad, it's just fire. It has these effects, depending on what happened before and after, is going to depend how things turn out. We have all the plants weakened, or at least we have all the plants weakened some, depending on how badly they were burned. We can also increase erosion susceptibility. We have those bare soils, so water tends to not soak in, and it tends to run off more. We dry out the soil. Wind erosion can be a big issue, too. We increase that evaporation. We decrease infiltration. All these things may end up causing a lot of weeds to come in, these disturbance species. Good thing is we have changed up those competitive relationships where everything's kind of starting from the same, same spot but we do have problems with potential erosion, with potentially more uh, moisture loss, and so we need to be aware of that. We've lost the litter, so we don't have anything to shade that soil. We may get those, we, we may get some plants have to have fire 
in order to get triggered to grow. Some of those are good ones, some of those are bad ones. We need to be aware of them, we need to watch, and if we need to control them, we need, we need to do it in a timely fashion. One thing though to keep in mind is getting that ground covered up is a big deal. Be uh, conservative about thinking that you need to go out there and kill everything that's coming up that looks like a weed because just covering that ground up may help you out in the long term. How badly that fire affects things has to do with the intensity, the duration of the fire. A lot of times in these wildfire situations, it's such a fast moving flame that the fire doesn't stay long enough to really do a lot of damage to individual plants. Now, we still get the loss of cover we still get the loss of the leaf material, but we don't cook those plants. If we get a if we get a wildfire that's moving really slowly, because there's not a lot of wind pushing it, and we have big buildups of fuel, that may be worse, at least in that spot, than having this big wall of flames that's 12 feet high and moving 70 miles an hour. The fuel load, the dryness of the fuel, the volatility of the fuel, that determines intensity. Duration is how fast is it moving. Then it is how much of an opportunity does that vegetation have to recover after the fire. If we got a moist soil profile when the fire starts, it's probably not going to be a big deal, especially if we get a little rain to follow up. But if it's dry when it starts and we have dry weather afterwards, it can be a long time recovered. This big intense fire that we had, they had a pretty moist profile because the fall had been nice. The upper part was dried out. Growth restarted pretty quickly afterwards because we were right towards the tail end of the dormant season. We had some good follow-up rains in the spring. Two years later, it probably looked better than it ever had in a long time. Conversely, north of there back in 2011 in the big bad drought that we had, they had a pretty intense fire or had a wildfire burned right along a major highway. Five years later, the guy had not replaced the fence along the highway because there was no grass to worry about. He, he, he wasn't even wanting to put livestock out there. Those preconditions and what happens after determines how fast things get better. All that's driven by the moisture, wind speed, temperature, growth conditions, and management afterwards. Just because it starts growing don't mean you need to have something out there grazing it right away. Let it cover over, let those plants get some roots down, then you can come in and start grazing. If you do that, you should be able to recover fairly quickly from a fire. All we can manage is cover, we can manage water in that the more cover we have, the more water we get in the ground and the less of it we have evaporate out. We can manage the intensity of grazing by animals. We can manage the frequency of the grazing if we get them off pretty regularly. We can manage distribution by where we put fences, where we put water how many herds we have, that's going to determine the opportunity for those plants to regrow and it's going to determine a lot of the competitive relationships among those plants. So 
we need to manage for that cover, recovery, distribution. We need to look maybe at some of those weedy plants. A lot of times when they're young, they're very palatable, even more so than the stuff we really think is good. We may be able to manage cover and still provide for the livestock if we look at those weedy plants as bonus plants that I call them. Get them while they're good, move on, let the other stuff come in behind them, and we can facilitate that recovery. And then managing fire in the first place, fuel loads and, and continuity. In a lot of cases, we need to maybe look at this fire as what I refer to as an insurmountable opportunity. If we're going to have to replace fences, if we're going to have to replace water developments, those kind of things, maybe we don't have to put them back where they were. If we would like to get animals to a new part of the landscape, Maybe we need to put a water point over there. Maybe we need to put fences in differently so that we can more equitably distribute those animals. If we need new water developments, maybe we need to put in something different than what we had. A different type of trough, a different size of trough, bigger water lines where we can run more animals at one time, those kind of things. That's all I've got. Uh, if there's any questions, um, I think I think Pete's got something he needs to talk about, so I'm done. Thank you, Doc. Lots of good information. Uh, I did have a question. Hey, how about the fires coming at you? You can jump in a water trough. Yeah, that. I mean, that's probably one of the best ways you can, because it's pretty dang hard to start that water on fire. Uh, and I don't think it's going to be burning long enough and hot enough that the water's going to boil on you. Um, you know, that uh, a culvert in a lot of cases may be as good if there's not a lot of dead material in there that may start on fire as the fire front passes and catches you. But it's some place that will be out of the heat. It'll be down low where you don't have to worry quite so much about the smoke and the hot gases. And so, any um, any play, I mean, even even a road ditch, especially if you can maybe start a little fire in that ditch and clear it out where you can get down in it, and the fire can run over top of you. I mean, you may still be burned, but you will maybe be alive. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we had a question if you if you gonna make your site deck uh, site deck available. Um, I can. Uh, I don't know what 